What's up, Ninja Nerds? I'm excited to uh, be here today. Sorry, it's been a little bit since we've done a um, case study. Um, just been having a lot of <laughs> stuff that we've been focusing on primarily uh, with the website. So I'm um, just very excited to be here today. Very excited to be able to uh, speak with you guys and uh, let's have some fun, man. So today our case study is we're going to be talking about a patient who presented um, to the emergency department with uh, chest pain. So let's go ahead and uh, get started, guys. All righty. So as you guys know, the whole medical disclaimer thing, um, just make sure you guys understand that these cases that we're presenting, they're not real, they're fictitious, and they're for educational purposes only. All right, so here we go. Let's get started. You got a 28-year-old male. He comes into the ED complaining of one day of severe chest pain that began suddenly after multiple episodes of retching and vomiting um, following an all-night bender. <laughs> uh, since the chest pain arose, he uh, has felt like he has a fever, some subjective fevers, like, you know, some chills. Uh, feels weak, unable to tolerate food or water. Um, the chest pain is best described as kind of an anterior chest pain. Um, and it has no radiating features to the back or to the shoulder or to the jaw or anything of that nature or into the arm. Um, it's worst whenever he's swallowing and he also feels like it's very tight um, kind of sensation in his throat, um, especially when he's, uh, he's speaking, okay? And he thinks his voice sounds a little bit different, like a little bit more hoarse in that nature, okay? So start thinking about that. So kind of a quick summary is uh, all night bender, retching, vomiting, anterior chest pain, non-radiating, um, worse when swallowing, uh, feels a tight sensation in his throat as an associated symptom, and has kind of this hoarseness of his voice. Okay, some subjective fevers, chills, and just generalized weakness. Unable to really tolerate food or water intake. Okie dokie. All right, so that's that. Let's go on to our physical exam. His heart rate, he's a little tachycardic at 140. Um, respiratory rate uh, 26, slightly tachypnic, nothing you know severe though. Blood pressure is a little elevated at 160 over 80. Temp is 100.4, so he's he's got that like low grade fever. Um, and SpO2, his uh, saturation of oxygen is 98% on room air. Okay. Cardiovascular wise, when you're listening to his you know to his heart, it sounds a little fast, tachycardic. Um, he has a regular rhythm a normal kind of S1 and S2 heart sound, um, but you hear kind of this crunching sound when you put the actual stethoscope on the person's chest, kind of in the upper chest region. You kind of hear like this, this crunching sound, okay? Which is actually a, a kind of an interesting sign, so we'll talk about that in, in a second. Uh, Pulmonary-wise, he does look a slightly tachypnic, so he does look like he's kind of breathing a little bit faster. But when you listen, he doesn't have any wheezing, he doesn't have any kind of um, ronchi um, uh, uh, audible, but you do hear some like slight bibasilar crackles a little bit, okay? Abdominal-wise, he, he has some difficulty being able to swallow, uh, but when you palpate the abdomen, it's soft, it's non-tender, he has normal active bowel sounds, okay? So again, Non-radiating chest pain, anterior chest pain, uh, previous night was, you know, all night bender, retching, vomiting, uh, chest pain worse whenever he's uh, trying to swallow, notices some changes, hoarseness of his voice a little bit, um, and again, he had some associated like subjective fevers, uh, generalized weakness, vitals, he's tachycardic, tachypnic, hypertensive, low-grade fever, and he has some uh, difficulty swallowing um, and uh, some bibasilar crackles. Okie dokie tachycardic and tachypnic. So suspected diagnosis, out of all of these, which one do you think about? Before I actually do this, before I actually answer this question, if you guys could, well, actually do this one first. What's your suspected diagnosis? Out of these four particular options, what is your suspected diagnosis? And then after you guys answer this question, what I want you guys to do is I want you to tell me, if you guys can, the top six differentials for chest pain that is life-threatening. Because those are the ones that you guys definitely can't forget. Okay, so I want you guys, after you guys answer this question, tell me which one of these you have a suspicion of. Maybe it's none of them. Maybe you guys are like, I don't think it's any of these, and that's fine. 
But then after you guys answer this question, I want you guys to tell me what is the six most immediate life-threatening differentials for chest pain, okay? So I just wanna look and see what you guys' answers are. So some people are saying Mallory Wise uh, tears. That's a good thing, especially for the boards. Um, that's not one of these options, but it, it could be something to think about, especially with that history of an all night bender kind of thing and retching and vomiting. Usually they do cough up a little bit of blood, but so some people are saying Borhoff syndrome. Um, uh, GERD, I think GERD's a good option as well. Um, MI, mediastinal tumor, tamponade, Borhoff syndrome, Borhoff syndrome, Borhoff, aortic dissection, MI. Okay. All right, so we got a lot of good options, and I like the ones that you guys are throwing out there. Um, so what I will do is, is I'm going to tell you guys in a second uh, which one you should be suspicious of, okay, uh, based upon the presentation that we have. Um, but the six top kind of differential diagnoses for chest pain that are immediately life-threatening, um, you can remember it by the mnemonic PETMAC. Okay, that's just how I remembered it. Um, pulmonary embolism. An esophageal rupture, kind of like something like Borhoff syndrome. Um, a tension pneumothorax. A myocardial infarction. So that could be like an NSTEMI or a STEMI and even sometimes unstable angina. An aortic dissection and cardiac tamponade. Okay, so those are the six most immediately like life-threatening kinds of uh, differentials for chest pain that you guys definitely want to remember. Okie dokie. All right. So you guys have some ideas of what to think about here within those six um, we have some of these that are actually listed here like aortic dissection Borhoff syndrome which could be like an esophageal rupture cardiac tamponade but GERD is also a very common uh, symptom of chest pain usually sometimes people may present with like chest pain that feels like it's kind of like a burning substernal chest pain uh, they might have some risk factors like obesity maybe they're eating high fatty foods salty foods eating things late before they go to bed you know not with a lot of time of staying kind of upright um, having some nasty tasting sensations in their mouth hoarseness of their voice difficulty swallowing these could all be things as well okay all right so you guys have one of those things to think about okay well technically if you really wanted to be specific the six things that you want to be thinking about no matter what is pet mac right so again pulmonary embolism esophageal rupture like borhoff syndrome um, tension pneumothorax myocardial infarction aortic dissection and cardiac tamponade okay i just listed some of those that maybe you have a higher suspicion of and think about those but based upon that all we have right now when we talk about our suspicion of those six causes or even the previous four ones that I listed for you, what imaging would you want first in this patient? Like what do I want a quick image to really try to help me to elucidate what is going on? So if I listed these options here and I'm going to consider, you know, again, um, really, 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 you know, try to think about these, which one of these images would you want to do first? And again, there could be multiple answers. Um, I'm just kind of looking for like if you guys had, you know, to take an exam on your boards or something like that, your board exams, and he had a question like this. It, so what would be something that you guys would get like immediately? It's a quick one. You can kind of really cover a big differential uh, right away. Would you guys pick an ECG, CTA of the chest? Would you pick a CTA of the chest and an echo? Would you do an ECG and a chest x-ray or would you just do an ECG only and that's it? So a lot of people are saying uh, option three, ECG and chest x-ray. Some are saying one, an ECG and CTA of the chest. So here's the thing, I would go with the quick one. You can do, when people come into the ED, you can do a portable chest x-ray really quickly. The person isn't like super unstable. Um, I could do a CT of the chest. That's not a problem. Um, but I think it's a good, like very simple thing. Like you slap on an EKG. It's a really quick thing. It's non-invasive. You kind of help yourself to rule out. Is there any ST segment depression, any ST segment elevation? Is there any things that are like making me think about pulmonary embolism, like that S1, Q3, T3? Um, 
And again, I think that's some things that you could think about. Um, the chest x-ray could help you to see is there any pneumomediastinum. Uh, could be potentially suggestive of a esophageal rupture like Borhoff syndrome. Is there any uh, pneumonia? Because pneumonia can also cause chest pain. Is there any uh, absence of vascular markings that could suggest like a pneumothorax? Is there any widening of the mediastinum that could be suggestive of an aortic dissection? So these are a lot of quick things that you could do. A CTA would be great if you're thinking about a pulmonary embolism, if you're thinking about you know an aortic dissection as well. Um, and it could even be helpful for an esophageal rupture um, as well. But, you know, that's a little bit, you know, I'd say I would wait preferably. I would probably go with three, ECG and chest x-ray. It's a really quick thing that you can do. And it seems like most of you guys pick that. And I think that's a great option. I would go with that. ECG, chest x-ray, see what you got from there. It can rule out a lot of stuff. And then from there, if you need to, go down the road of getting a little bit more intense study with a CT angiogram or a CT of the chest, you could do that. Okie dokie artichoke here's the image of the chest x-ray of this patient so we got the chest x-ray before let me just actually preface then um, the EKG just showed sinus tachycardia um, there was no ST segment uh, elevation no ST segment depression there was no S1 Q3 T3 um, you know no de Winters T waves no you know in, inverted T waves hyperacute T waves there was nothing on there except for just the simple uh, sinus tachycardia Nothing that was really suggestive of acute coronary syndrome um, in that area. Okay, so right away, I'm just letting you guys know the EKG I'm not showing you here. It was just a normal sinus rhythm with sinus tachycardia. Okay, here's our chest x-ray though. If we look at this chest x-ray, is there anything that pops out at you guys? So again, go back to our differentials. We're kind of on the low end. We can check troponins if we wanted to, but ECG should kind of be like your actual like most important diet. Like ECG is actually way more uh, diagnostic of acute coronary syndrome than troponins are because you can have troponinemia and it not be related to an NSTEMI or a STEMI. Okay, so that's really important to remember, ECG should be kind of your first diagnostic test. It has a higher sensitivity and specificity for um, an acute coronary syndrome than troponins will. So the troponins, I wouldn't worry about those. His ECG definitely ruled out any, at that point in time, any uh, NSTEMI or STEMI kind of signs. So we've taken that off the board at least. Now the next thing is to look at the chest X-ray. And there's a couple things that we can look at here. Do we see any loss of vascular markings around the edges of the pleura? And I, don't, I see vascular markings all the way along the edges of the pleura. I don't see any obvious pneumothorax. Where's the trachea? Is it midline? Is it deviated? It's not deviated. And so with that being said, since I don't see any deviation of the trachea, I don't see any shifting of the mediastinum, I don't see any loss of vascular markings around the periphery, I can kind of rule out um, any kind of true evidence here of a tension pneumothorax. Okay, I also don't see any kind of opacities here that would be suggestive of pneumonia. Okay, so so far we've kind of helped at least rule out a tension pneumothorax. Our ECG was normal, so it helps us to pretty much rule out again STEMI, STEMI at this point in time. I don't see any opacities which would suggest a pneumonia. Um, what were the other things? Cardiac tamponade. A cardiac tamponade, you know, usually that would be a good one to look at for your echo as well. You know, doing a bedside echo, looking to see if there's any kind of like cardiomegaly. Usually if there's a cardiomegaly, like a really enlargement of the heart, um, that could also be a sign. I don't really see any cardiomegaly, but doing a bedside ultrasound wouldn't hurt. Let's say I did a bedside ultrasound, guys. I did a bedside ultrasound and I noticed no pericardial effusion or strangulation of the heart. So I don't see any cardiomegaly here. I can kind of say, I have a low suspicion of cardiac tamponade, but hey, I'm going to be a very awesome ninja and I'm going to slap on the ultrasound, do a quick bedside echo. And I didn't notice any fluid uh, pericardial effusions or strangulation of the heart. So therefore, I can rule out a cardiac tamponade. I got no tension pneumothorax. I got no cardiac tamponade. I have um, unlikelihood of NSTEMI or STEMI based upon the EKG. Okay. I have no pneumonias as well. So now I'm kind of left with esophageal rupture. I'm left with, um, what else? Aortic dissection, potentially, um, and a pulmonary embolism. Okay, let's go back and think about this um, and just, again, have better understanding of how to kind of elucidate this stuff. You never want to base everything off of just like the clinical content, like off of the textbook definition, but let's try to think, you know, based upon that for now. 
When a person presents with an aortic dissection, the chest pain is usually um, a, a very intense chest pain that is usually radiating into the back. That's not always the case. It's kind of like a tearing chest pain, radiates into the back. Usually they may have changes in pulses in both sides of the arms if it was kind of at a point where it affects like the subclavian vessels or an aspect of where the, you know, maybe a little bit more around the aortic arch of some kind. But you know, another thing to look at is do I see any widening of the mediastinum here on the chest x-ray? Usually what you do is you find a, a point where the mediastinum is, you know, generally in the kind of this area, the uh, superior aspect of the mediastinum, and you would measure the width. And usually if it's like greater than like 10, some will say 8 to 10 millimeters and stuff like that, uh, 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 sorry, centimeters, then you would be a little bit more uh, concerned for an aortic dissection. So I, I don't see anything that really like tugs away at me and says, ooh, you know, this could be a aortic dissection. There's an obvious widening of the mediastinum. So I'm not really kind of in that area of saying it's an aortic dissection. They didn't present with any kind of acute uh, chest pain that's like tearing in quality, radiating into the back. Also, I don't see an obvious widening of the mediastinum. Still doesn't mean that it can't be a potentially an aortic dissection. But think about risk factors. Risk factors for aortic dissection is high blood pressure. If they have smoke, if they're a smoker, this person didn't have any history of smoking. Um, and if they have like high cholesterol, and this person didn't have any history of high cholesterol, uh, they really didn't have any pertinent past medical history. They just present. They came in presenting with some high blood pressure. Whether that high blood pressure is from the pain that they have going on right now, and eh, who knows? But again, he was hypertensive, so he could potentially have an aortic dissection. You can't rule it out yet. We don't have enough to definitively say that. But let's go to something else. Whenever I told you guys on his physical exam, something that really popped out, and I really wanted you guys to think about that, a crunching kind of sensation or you know, whenever we were palpating, uh, uh, when we put in the stethoscope on the chest to listen. Uh, we 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 felt like some crunching. It's called Hamann sign, right? Or Hamann sign, however you want to say it. That sometimes is indicative of like some subcutaneous like emphysema of some kind. So maybe there's like some air leaking into the subcutaneous tissue. If I look at this chest X-ray, you need. Oh, whoopsie! Sorry about that, guys. You notice this streaking? Like there's some air streaking. Like right here, you notice this uh, this lucency here, this black lucency right there. And you notice it more on the right side than you notice notice it on the left side. But definitely, if you kind of look here, you notice this streaking of kind of hyper lucency, kind of sign moving down the mediastinum here. You guys, notice that, and you see a little bit here as well. There's definitely some mediastinal air. So that's interesting. There's mediastinal kind of air here, potentially suggesting a pneumomediastinum. A pneumomediastinum with a crunching sound, whenever you're kind of like listening, you know, to the chest or palpating around the chest, along with a chest pain that is anterior. It's not really radiating. It's they have difficulty with swallowing, and they had a previous issue where they were all night bender drinking and they were retching and vomiting excessively. That makes me lean way more to like a, an esophageal rupture. And so there's a rupture in the esophagus that's causing air to leak into the mediastinum and then potentially into like the subcutaneous tissue. So that might make me think mm, this person could be having a pneumomediastinum here secondary to an esophageal rupture. Okay. So I'm kind of leaning more to that area just based upon the chest x-ray, based upon their history, based upon their physical exam. I've pretty much on the most part ruled out n stemi stemi. I've ruled out any tension pneumothorax. I've ruled out cardiac tamponade. I still haven't completely ruled out a pulmonary embolism, which is still a likely possibility. Usually you can look for what's called a Westermark sign or a Hampton's hump, but that's not always a great thing to look for on the chest x-ray. You really need kind of a, a, a CT pulmonary angiogram. You could do a uh, ultrasound, an echo of the chest, and look to see if the right ventricle is a little bit more dilated, 
if it's not contracting as well, if you notice less vertical movement of the right ventricle, you can even do this um, echocardiographic test called a um, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. It's called TAPSI and measure that out if you want to. Um, but let's say that I did my bedside ultrasound um, of the you know bedside echo and I didn't notice any RV dilation. I didn't notice any RV dysfunction. I didn't notice any decreased vertical movement of the right ventricle. Um, I don't really see too much of a pulmonary embolism there. So again, I have a very low suspicion of all of the things and I have a very high suspicion of Borhoff syndrome or an esophageal rupture at this point in time. And I hope, I hope that makes sense to you guys, okay? Oh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, a lot of you guys, okay, Borhoff syndrome, this type of pain is confusing. Yeah, it's a little bit, it's, it is, it is a little bit confusing. And that's sometimes one of the big things. Again, have that differential in your head of what you wanna think about that's really concerning and run through it and try to analyze this both in a clinical context, really thinking about their history, their physical exam, and then using your diagnostic test to aid in that. Okay, so that's what we got so far. So we've done our ECG, we've done our chest X-ray. We still aren't completely sold. Um, that's more difficult if you don't have any previous bedside echo for the patient though. It is, um, if you don't know if they had any history of like a pulmonary hypertension, if you don't know if they had any history of underlying COPD, interstitial lung disease, they may have a baseline dilation of their right ventricle. Yeah, it's, it's true. This person didn't have any past medical history, pertinent past medical history of any COPD, interstitial um, lung disease, pulmonary hypertension from an un, uh, un, unknown etiology or known etiology. So I would say that it's not necessarily wrong to look at their right ventricle to see if there was an acute dilation. But yeah, you, that is a true thing to think about. Um, to say it's not a, you know it's not always a true diagnostic. R Runar Johnson, it's not a true diagnostic enough to say okay RV dilation. Uh, it's, it's, it's new, it's old, I don't know. That's why I said it, you definitely need a CT pulmonary angiogram to definitively diagnose a pulmonary embolism. You can't go just based upon your, um, your right ventricle dilation, but it could help in aiding in your diagnosis. Since this person didn't have any kind of uh, past medical history that would suggest he would have any underlying RV dilation, um, I would say that it would be a helpful diagnostic test and maybe ruling in at least to further evaluate a pulmonary embolism, but he did not have that. Okie dokie. So what test would you guys want now? Um, here, let me out, I'll give you guys options. <laughs> would you want a CT um, with oral contrast? Would you guys want a contrast esophagram with gastrographin? Would you want a barium esophagram? Or would you want a, <laughs> a median sternotomy? Just go in there and look for anything. What would you guys think is, is good? So some of you guys are saying CT. Some are saying barium esophagram. Some are saying contrast esophagram with gastrographin. So a lot of you guys are leaning to a CT. <laughs> uh, Giga Drain, okay. Remind me not to go to you. <laughs> she picked the median sternotomy. She said, start strong. <laughs> All right. All righty. All right, so you could do two, uh, you have two options here. Okay, first thing I think you need to understand is, is this person hemodynamically stable? Um, I guess is a really good question first, because that's going to determine which test you would do. Um, if a person is hemodynamically stable at this point in time, the exam, you know, your clinical, your exams that you guys will take for your boards and stuff like that may suggest one over the other. 
In real life, you probably could go with two of these options here. Like in a clinical setting, you technically could pick one, either one of these. The question is that you guys got to think about is, is this person hemodynamically stable or not? Are they, is there hypo, is there any hypotension? Is there severe tachycardia that is influencing their hypotension? Are they, you know, not able to breathe properly and tolerate laying flat or doing on any kind of CT? Is there any issue of respiratory distress that you're concerned about? What in this would suggest an aspect of hemodynamic instability or stability? So based upon this, I would say that the person is hemodynamically stable. I don't see any signs of acute hypotension. Um, I don't see any significant tachycardia that is influencing and making them become unstable. There is a reason for that sinus tachycardia, obviously, and things to think about with sinus tachycardia is are they hypovolemic? Are they you know, hypoxemic? Are they in pain? Do they have a fever? Do they have a pulmonary embolism? There's a lot of different things to think about. Are they hypothermic? Right, so we could say, I don't know which one the sinus tachycardia is due to. It's unlikely that they're hypovolemic because they're hypertensive. Um, and usually that would kind of be on that other end of a little bit, you know, more hypovolemic, but you could give them some fluid and see if that changes it. It's unlikely that they're hypoxemic as they were satting 98% on room air. Um, they could be in pain and they are in pain, right? They complained of anterior chest pain and it was really bad. Um, so that could be a reason that they're hypertensive and tachycardic. When you're in pain, your sympathetic nervous system gets activated. And then obviously if the sympathetic nervous system is activated, it's going to increase the sympathetic outflow tract to the heart, right? So you're going to get an increase in inotropic action, an increase in, uh, you know, systemic vascular resistance, an increase in chronotropic action. So you can get an increased heart rate and increased blood pressure, um, and maybe even breathe a little bit faster too. So there's, it could be that this guy's just in pain, and that's the reason for the sinus tachycardia. But again, I don't think that the sinus tach is significant enough to make him hypotensive. He's also not in any respiratory distress. So. With that being said, I don't think the person is hemodynamically unstable. You may disagree, but I don't think they're hemodynamically unstable. So I don't think that they need a CT with oral contrast at this point in time. If it's in the, ex, you know, your, your actual board exams, it's nothing wrong with picking a CT with oral contrast in an emergency department setting. That's fine. You can do that. It's an easy thing to do. But I think that they could get a contrast esophagram with gastrographin as the actual like exam answer. Okay. And the reason why I think some of you guys said this, oh, dang it, sorry guys, um, is why wouldn't I just do barium? Barium is a little bit more agitating uh, to the actual, you know, if it does, if there is an esophageal rupture and that leaks out, it's a little bit more agitating and, and damaging to the actual parenchymal lung tissue. So I would go with gastrographin as a superior type of contrast in comparison to barium. So if you had to pick between these two, a contrast esophagram with gastrographin versus a barium, I'd pick gastrographin. It's just much more superior and less agitating. Again, if you had to pick, and a median sternotomy is just off the table. That was just the, I needed something else to put in there. <laughs> but if you had to pick between number two and number one, on the exam, you're going to pick number two because they're not hemodynamically unstable. If they were... Uh, you know, if they were maybe a little bit more in that sense, you could do like a CT with oral contrast. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but I, I, I would go with the end of saying, okay, the contrast esophagram with gastrographin is going to be probably the, the easy test to do. Okay. Let me see. Um, but we haven't ruled out P definitively yet. A CT might be held. Again, you could do a CT with um, oral contrast isn't going to give you that answer. Um, again, you could do a CTPA. Let's say I did a CTPA, um, Renard Johnson, sorry, uh, and there was no pulmonary embolism. Uh, again, you could do it. There's nothing wrong with doing that with doing a CTPA. Um, I just had a low likelihood of suspicion based upon that chest x-ray and based upon their history and physical exam. So I would probably just defer for doing the CTPA. You can do D-dimers. D-dimers are honestly a waste of time. I'm just being honest. They're a waste of time to do. Um, you can, if you have a very low pretest probability, uh, you could order a D-dimer, but it's usually best to just go to a CTPA. Um, and again, I had a low likelihood of suspicion here. So therefore I just went with, uh, going with the, the, the high suspicion of at this point in time an esophageal rupture. Um, he is hypovolemic um, from vomiting and drinking alcohol. He very well could be. Very well could be. Give him some fluid. See if that helps with the sinus tachycardia. 
There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a great uh, idea to say, okay, is he sagging his tachycardic because he's hypovolemic if he was vomiting a lot? Yeah, he surely could be. Give him some fluids. Let's say we gave him some fluids um, and he was still sinus tachycardic. Do you think he's hypovolemic? Eh, unlikely. You can give him some more fluids, but again, you just got to be careful. When you just bolus and bolus and bolus someone with con constant liters of fluid and their heart rate isn't really budging or changing, it's probably unlikely that it was a hypovolemic cause. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with giving him some fluid. I think it's a great idea. There's, you can't ever go wrong with giving some fluid. It's just being a careful with that fluid choice. Um, if you kind of consistently keep bolusing people with lots and lots and lots of fluid, it might help them. Um, but just be be aware. You know, you don't want it to con consistently keep giving fluid. If they have good hearts, they probably won't develop any pulmonary edema if they have good ejection fractions. But uh, giving some fluid, not going to hurt the person. But let's say that we gave them fluid and their sinus tachycardia didn't really budge much. It's probably that they're in a lot of pain. Again, you could do a CT with oral contrast, but a CT with oral contrast isn't going to show up in uh, the actual vessels. So if you do a CT with oral contrast, that's just going to go down through the esophagus. So it'll light up the esophagus, make it a little bit easier to see if any contrast is leaking out of the esophagus and into the mediastinum area. Again, I'm being honest with you guys. There is nothing wrong uh, when you get a CT with oral contrast. It's just in your exam, you're, you're probably going to have to pick a contrast esophagram with gastrographin. Okie dokie. Alrighty, so that's what I would go with here in this situation. So we did a gastrographin study, and this is what we got here. What do you think? What do you guys think about that gastrographin study? Sorry, I'm just reading you guys' uh, questions here, your answers. Margaret Rainey, what do you mean his BP isn't great already? <laughs> He's hypertensive, and again, it's likely from the pain. Usually if someone's hypovolemic, they would more likely be a little bit lower on the softer end of the blood pressure range. That's why, again, I there's nothing wrong with giving a person fluid. That's why I was trying to say that. Again, I hope I wasn't coming off like a, like a douche or anything. But, yeah, there's nothing wrong with giving the guy fluids. I, I just am unlikely to say based upon his uh, physical exam. Again, they take into consideration that, yes, he was vomiting. He was retching and all that stuff like that. So he very well could be hypovolemic. Uh, it's just unlikely if they're hypovolemic, usually that's going to lower their effective arterial blood volume. And potentially, if you lower blood volume, you lower blood pressure by that kind of direct relationship. He was hypertensive and tachycardic, which makes me think it's more of a sympathomimetic effect from pain. But Yeah, exactly. I, that's why I, I don't think you can give him fluids. Um, it's not going to hurt him. He, I, he likely has a very, he's a young guy, no past medical history. So he probably has a very good ejection fraction. So any of that fluid that you give him, he'll probably just put out into a systemic circulation. He'll probably pee it out. Um, he'll, and, and that probably won't hurt him again. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but again, I think giving him fluids is probably not going to be the answer, you know, to, to change his sinus tachycardia. But again, that's just my, uh, my opinion. All right. Yeah. I see that looks dense. Uh, all right, that's where I got the. Yeah, so I think one of the things you guys can see here is that the contrast is running down through the esophagus and there's a leakage of it. You guys see this leakage right here of the contrast out of the esophagus and into the area of the mediastinum on that right side? You guys see that? So that again, that would kind of make me think that there's definitely some some <laughs> rupture uh, of the esophagus here. So definitely some rupture of the esophagus here into the mediastinum, and actually a little bit here down into the area of the abdomen a little bit too. Okie dokie. All right. So I think we have a pretty good idea here that this is an esophageal rupture. Okay, an esophageal rupture is definitely likely. So to go back, let's kind of like. Let's kind of go back um, before we look at this next thing to kind of answer uh, this question that some of you guys are asking, like, why not just get the CT? Um, but before we do that, again, we've kind of gone through our kind of process here, right? We had a guy come in with anterior chest pain, 
previous history was uh, all night bender, drinking, going ham, um, and then had some uh, vomiting, ex you know, pretty extensive vomiting uh, because of the, you know, excessive alcohol consumption. He came in, anterior chest pain, no radiation, had some difficulty swallowing, also felt like the pain was worse whenever he did swallow. He was sinus tachycardic, he was hypertensive, um, he was a little tachypnic as well. And again, we kind of talked about this a little bit, maybe beat the, the the horse a little bit too much, but he was sinus tachycardic and hypertensive and tachypnic most likely from the pain that he was having, unlikely to be from hypovolemia causing the sinus tachycardia, unlikely to be from uh, hypoxemia, unlikely to be from, a, he, he, he did have a low-grade fever that could participate in it, but I think the fever is probably unrelated, it's probably reactive from his uh, actual situation here. Um, but it's unlikely to be from a, a, a pulmonary embolism. But again, we didn't rule out a pulmonary embolism completely. So you got to go through your differential. Again, remember the PETMAC, right? So pulmonary embolism, esophageal rupture, tension pneumothorax, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, and then cardiac tamponade. We talked briefly. We got an ECG ruled out in STEMI STEMI. We got a chest x-ray that ruled out a tension pneumothorax. No cardiomegaly slapped on the ultrasound, ruled out a cardiac tamponade. Didn't see any RV dilation. Again, RV dilation, not always definitively diagnostic of a pulmonary embolism. We could have gotten a CTPA, but the chest x-ray did kind of help me to see that there was some mediastinal air and he had crunching on his chest. Kind of that Hammond sign, which kind of gives you a little bit of an idea that there was subcutaneous air leaking there. <laughs> so again, made, making me think of potentially a esophageal rupture causing Borhoff syndrome. We then decided to get a contrast um, uh, esophagram with gastrographin because it's less agitating and irritating, a little bit more water soluble in comparison to um, barium. We picked that over a CT because he was hemodynamically stable. Okay. So a CT with uh, oral contrast is ordered when? You could do this in what situation? So this is what they actually say, um, you know, in the, in the actual literature as to why you would get a CT with oral contrast. Is it which one of these options? Are they unstable, uncooperative in their exam? Is their esophagram inconclusive? Is there a pneumoperitoneum on their chest x-ray? Or is it all the above? And again, this is just kind of um, like what we would kind of go based off of based upon the exam. Okay. What would you guys say is one of the things that kind of links here as to why would we get a CT with oral contrast over getting a contrast esophagram with gastrographin? This is why I don't drink. I love it, Runar. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a bad. I don't drink either. It's no, no, no bueno. I know there's some literature saying that, like you know, a little bit of red wine, you know, can help with uh, your HDL, but so it's all moderate, you know, just in, in your acceptable consumption. <laughs> so some people are saying four. Some people are saying, you know, I bet all four. <laughs> Yeah, it's all of them. It's all of them. You know, it's, again, pneumoperitoneum on a chest X-ray. That's again a little bit more concerning. Um, so I would, I would definitely kind of go straight to a CT with oral contrast if you had a pneumoperitoneum right away. Um, that's a big one. Um, esophagram inconclusive. Again, you, if if you didn't see any leakage of contrast out from the barium, uh, for the barium, or particularly again, you should probably go with the gastrographin. Um, if there was nothing, no, no leakage there, you might want to go with a CT. You get a little bit more of a, a, a better image to really see if there was anything there. And if they're unstable, again, hemodynamically unstable, uncooperative in their exam, you would kind of go for a CT with oral contrast. So again, this is why, again, I'm giving you guys the reason, you know, the, the, the textbook answer as to why you would do a CT with oral contrast. Again, when you guys are out there in the real world, you're doctors, you're making medical decisions, you can pick whichever one of those two you want. It's just taking into consideration what the evidence-based literature suggests. It says you should do a CT with oral contrast in these scenarios and go to a gastrographin study in those scenarios. Okay? Margaret Rand, I bet those HDL studies are funded by Big One. <laughs> yeah, probably. All right. I hope that makes sense, guys. I know there was a little bit of confusion as to why not just doing a CT with oral contrast. And I want to go back. Someone did ask, why not do the CT with oral contrast? to see if they have a PE. Again, going back to that, the oral contrast is going through the esophagus. If you give, when you give um, contrast for a CT angiogram, that's going into the vessels, angio vessels. So it would light up the pulmonary arteries or, you know, if you're, if you're trying to pick up what the actual, uh, the, the flow looks like in the pulmonary arteries in that phase. And if you wanted to do a CT angiogram, particularly looking at 
the systemic circulation, you'd have to, again, take the pictures of the CT at that phase when the blood is flowing through the systemic circulation or through the aorta. Okie dokie. All right, so what's the last... Okay, let, let, let's say in the, in the worst case scenario for this guy, we've already kind of diagnosed him. We, ha we have a good idea that there was an esophageal rupture uh, causing some pneumomediastinum leading to Borhoff syndrome. Uh, what's the last diagnostic test, though? Let's say that you did a uh, gastrographin study. It was inconclusive. Okay, you got a CT with oral contrast because of that reason. It was inconclusive. Then what's the last diagnostic test? What would you guys go with? For the love of goodness, please don't say a median sternotomy. <laughs> would you go with a median sternotomy? Would you go with a flexible endoscopy? Would you go with a CT pulmonary angiogram? Would you go with a barium esophagram? So taking our patient into consideration, which one would you guys do? Let's say that you did the CT with oral contrast. It was inconclusive. Let's say that you guys did a barium, uh, sorry, a, a gastrographin, I'm, I'm even messing up, a gastrographin study, um, esophagram, and that was inconclusive. Which one would you guys lean to saying was the last diagnostic test? Warriors like freaking three, baby. Go pulmonary angiogram. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, if you, if a lot of you guys are really thinking that this is a pulmonary embolism, go to do the CT pulmonary angiogram. Dentin, come on, man. <laughs> Median sternotomy. I can't with you. I can't. Oh my gosh, crack them. <laughs> So again, let's, let's take into consideration that we've kind of ruled out pulmonary uh, embolism at this point. CT pulmonary angiogram isn't going to be beneficial if we really think that this is a Borhoff syndrome. If you guys have a high suspicion of a um, pulmonary embolism, go ahead, do a CTPA. Um, but we're thinking that this is a esophageal rupture, so Borhoff syndrome, right? So the next thing would be, unfortunately, this is the most invasive one, and you gotta you gotta be careful with this one. Um, is you would you would thread down a camera to see if you can visibly see where there is a rupture in the esophagus. So doing a flexible upper endoscopy would be the next test in this scenario. Okie dokie, artichoke. I would go with a flexible endoscopy as the option. We are not cracking open a chest. Uh, again, I don't think a barium esophagram is going to be helpful because we already had our gastrographin study. And a CT pulmonary angiogram is leaning you guys, again, back to a pulmonary embolism, and that's your high suspicion. If it is, go ahead and do it. But again, think about potentially with uh, um, a pulmonary embolism. I, I, I didn't give you enough of his history to probably lean towards this, but with a pulmonary embolism, what are think about your risk factors. Again, you got to think about that Verco's triad that would suggest that maybe he had a high risk of a DVT that broke off and then led to a pulmonary embolism. Does he have any hypercoagulability? Does he have any endothelial dysfunction? Right. And uh, when you guys come into that kind of scenario, was there a period of stasis of blood flow? Then if there was any of those things that could influence one of those three components of the triad, then sure. He was a young guy. He didn't have any past medical history. He wasn't having any post-operative Im immobility. There's no hypercoagulable condition on his chart review. Um, you know, again, there's nothing that really kind of like pops out as a, a PE. That doesn't mean that you can't have one. But again, I, I just want to make sure we understand why I'm not leaning towards a, a pulmonary embolism. So a flexible endoscopy would kind of be the, the go-to here. It's a good question, Denton. I like that question. Would you see any electrical alternates on the ECG because of extra fluid in the mediastinum? So there wasn't any fluid in the mediastinum. There was like air and stuff like that, but there could be some esophageal um, contents that potentially could have leaked out. Um, but that is a good question. If there's enough that's in the mediastinum that it could potentially alternate, I mean, alter the electrical activity that's being picked up by the electrodes on the chest, sure, it could cause an electrical alternance. Um, I would lean more to the electrical alternates being more pre precisely seen in a, a cardiac tamponade. And that goes back, great question actually, because that leads me back to the thing to say, okay, let's say that we were thinking cardiac tamponade, there's another thing you can get from the EKG. It's not always perfect, but it's something that you can think about with cardiac tamponade on the EKG. What do you see on the EKG? If there's fluid that's alter altering the electrical flow, from the heart to the chest electrodes, what would be a very important thing to look for on the EKG? 
I want to see if you guys know, remember this from our EKG lecture. This is a, a good question to think about. Can a pneumothorax alter the EKG leads? It very well can. It could. It could. Again, use your use your judgment though. If you go listen to the other thing you could do, we didn't even think about this, but think about it. You go, you stick your your stethoscope on their chest, <laughs> and you listen to their chest. Do I hear any decrease or absent lung sounds? That's another thing. Is the trachea deviated again? There was nothing really to suggest the tension pneumothorax, but what would you see with a cardiac tamponade? I really want you guys to think about this. Uh, it's just we're talking about it. Might as well, you know ask the question what, what, what would be in a, in, a, in a beautiful kind of perfect world you would see what less electric there's a farther distance for the electrical activity from the heart to have to travel to hit the electrodes boom maza i love it you, you you beast and i think muhammad actually said it as well i didn't see that sorry about that yeah lower amplitude lower qrs voltage great that's what I would say is a big thing, a low QRS voltage. In addition, if the heart has a lot of, you know, significant kind of fluid, there can be an electrical alternance, right? That's another thing as well to be thinking about. So great, 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 great job, guys. All right. Anyway, off my high horse, let's move on to the next thing. We've kind of got the uh, concept down here. We have a very high suspicion, uh, actually we've diagnosed for the most part an esophageal rupture, it's suspicious that that caused the Borhoff syndrome, causing the pneumomediastinum, leading to some chest pain. Person is MPO, meaning that nothing per oral. Um, what do you guys want to treat this guy with while he's MPO? Hmm? What do you guys want? What therapies do you think would be beneficial in this young man? So do we want to put a NG tube down to decompress the bowels and give him some Zofran since he did have some vomiting and we don't want him to have any more kind of like nausea and vomiting? Would you give him an NG tube, maybe give him some IV fluid so that he doesn't become dehydrated if he develops consistent vomiting or we're suctioning tons of gastric contents from his, his, his belly that could potentially decrease his blood volume and, again, Zofran to reduce nausea? Would you give him an NG tube only, none of the other stuff? Would you give him an NG tube, some Zofran, some IV fluids, and some pain control? Which one of these would you guys go with? So, girl, Maryam said IV fluids, glucose, and some electrolytes, potassium, and sodium. I definitely include a pain control. Muhammad said four. Dixon said Zofran. <laughs> Tinker fit. I would whack him with all of it. I like your thinking, buddy. Yeah, I think the the best ob obvious option here is kind of like all of all the above, right? Uh, NG tube, and I think um, you're just being very careful um, when you do the NG tube. Obviously, you don't want that NG tube to just go through the esophageal hole and then into the into the mediastinum. So that's one thing to be very careful of. I think someone was alluding to that. Um, Zofran, because again, if they're nauseous and they're vomiting, we don't want them to continue to keep doing that refluxing some of that actual gastric contents in through that hole um, through the esophageal rupture. We want to give them IV fluids because if we are suctioning off tons of gastric contents or if they're having excessive vomiting and we don't want them to become hypovolemic, so we want to give them some fluids as well and give them some pain control. Um, and again, that when you're giving pain control, it's thinking about, you know, how much pain are they in? If this guy's in a lot of pain, you can try, you can, you can trial something like, uh, like an, an NSAID of some kind, like an IM or IV Ketorolac, which is also, you know, known as Toradol. Um, and you could also, if that's not working, if you trial something like that, then you can go to the next step, which is maybe a little bit more of an opioids. Opioids, I think wouldn't be a bad thing here because if this guy's in a lot of pain, let's treat the pain. Um, and so it's something like hydromorphone or dilaudid, something like fentanyl, something like morphine, uh, those kinds of options may be right, you know, somewhat beneficial in this kind of pain. Okie dokie. Now the next question is antibiotic coverage. Which one of these? And, and, I, and I guess the good question is why the heck do I got to give this guy antibiotics? Well, he's got an opening between his, um, 
esophagus and into the actual like you know around the mediastinum and parenchymal lung tissue so therefore he's exposed to infections that could actually come from any of the oral uh, oral flora any of the actual contents that are coming up from the actual uh, if he does have any vomiting and any of that contents from the actual um, uh, stomach or uh, near the esophagus refluxes into through that hole into the mediastinal tissue um, he's definitely at risk for infections um, and so you have to think about some of the actual flora um, that is within the esophagus or within the actual gastrointestinal tract. And so you got to be thinking about gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic bacteria. <laughs> tramadol, you can do it. I'm not the biggest fan of tramadol, um, but again, to each his own. Um, tramadol is not a bad drug. I just am not a, a huge fan of it. Um, and it might be a little bit more of a biased opinion on my end, um, just because, again, working in a neuro ICU, tramadol has the ability to lower seizure threshold. So it's just not a drug that I ever really prescribe, ever, uh, generally ever. So morphine would relax the patient. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think a little bit of opioid wouldn't hurt the guy. You just got to be, you know, obviously be diligent. You guys are prescribers out there. You want to try to um, just trial things you know it wouldn't hurt to give some iv ketorolac and see if that minimizes the pain the guy's probably in real pain he has a real medical condition he's not he's not a uh and i hate to use the term kind of an individual seeking pain medication for a underlying pain disorder or drug abuse kind of scenario so i think you know treating the guy for the real pain that he has is something that you should try to you know think about you guys are awesome man you guys are so smart oh sorry so let's, oh my gosh. Let's see what you guys are saying here. Kind of a mixture of answers here. Okay, so a little bit of a mixture, no complete definitive answer on this one. So vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole. So vancomycin would cover your gram-positive bacteria. Cefepime would cover your gram-negative bacteria um, and some pseudomonas if there was a risk of that. And metronidazole would cover your anaerobic bacteria. Okay, well, that does cover all of them. Cefazolin, it's good for kind of your anaerobes. Um, Zosin, or pepericillin tazobactam, is good for gram-negative bacteria and pseudomonas. And clindamycin is, is not a bad one. It's also going to cover your anaerobic bacteria. So you get a little bit there. Um, one of the things that you're missing with number two, though, is you don't get a ton of gram-positive coverage. You know, that's not a bad one, though. Three, amoxicillin, you're going to get some gram-positive, a little bit of gram-negative coverage. Ceftriaxone, you're going to get some gram-negative coverage. And gentamicin is a very broad spectrum. It can cover you know, some gram-negative, and you can also get um, some pseudomonas coverage. Three is not really a great option, to be honest with you. It's probably not one that I would go for. Um, you have no anaerobic coverage truly for that one. That's great. Um, four, vancomycin, penicillin, levofloxacin, vanco, you got your positive, gram positive penicillin. You pretty much never use penicillin unless it's kind of a person who has um, syphilis. Levofloxacin is a pretty broad spectrum as well. It covers gram negative um, bacteria as well. So I probably wouldn't go with uh, vancomycin. Uh, I wouldn't go with number four for the one reason we just never use penicillin unless the person uh, is having syphilis. So again, three and four, I'm cutting out for those reasons. Uh, three, I'm cutting out because I don't really have a, a good anaerobic coverage. Four, I'm cutting out because we just don't use penicillin ever. Um, and we don't have, uh, that's just not a great coverage to be honest with you. Um, Again, you don't really have a significant amount of anaerobic coverage, and levofloxacin is a very broad spectrum, so you're going to get some gram-negative activity, but again, it's just not a, not a drug that you're going to want to go with right away in this kind of scenario. So we're between one and two. I think one of the things that two lacks is that you don't have a ton of gram-positive bacteria coverage. However, one of the things to think about is, like, you know, there isn't always tons of gram-positive uh, bacteria present within a person who, you know, within the oral flora. However, you do want to be very careful. Vancomycin is a very powerful drug. There is always risk of acute kidney injury from that, from an intrarenal AKI, um, because it is kind of has a nephrotoxic effect. But I think one of the big things to do here is you want to make sure that you don't miss anything. When a person comes in with this kind of, you know, severe of a condition, you want to make sure that you have a very broad coverage 
And I just think that vancomycin is going to give you a very good coverage. And again, you can always discontinue that once your cultures come back and you've kind of narrowed down the organism. Vancomycin is just a very good one to give gram-positive coverage. Cefepime, again, it's a very good drug that's going to cover a lot of gram-negative and pseudomonas. And metronidazole, you're going to get that good anaerobic coverage. So I would go with this one as an option of number one, vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole. Okay. Cefazolin, it's a great drug. Um, you can give that for gram, um, you know, your, your anaerobic bacteria, and even some gram negative bacteria is covered by. Um, but it's usually kind of like a, a, a surgical prophylactic drug. Um, Piperacillin tazobactam, it's, zosin is a great drug as well that covers a lot of uh, gram negative and uh, pseudomonas. And clindamycin, it's also a good one, so you're going to get some uh, anaerobic coverage. But again, I would go with vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole. Okie dokie. Yeah, um, As, Asa Debev, um, I hope I said your name right, I apologize if I didn't, As, Asa Beck, red man syndrome, that's usually if you infuse um, vancomycin pretty quickly, um, you can get a red man syndrome, usually. yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Oh, Margaret, she hit it, she got that, yep. Amish, why are you wearing a cap always? I don't know. Just like, I like hats. Probably because I'm, I'm getting there with the age. I'm starting to lose some hair. <laughs> All right, anyway. Let's go to the next thing. What are not? This is definitely turning into a nice, like, long um, uh, case study. But I'm, I'm enjoying it. I like talking with you guys. It's fun. What are not indications for surgery out of all of these? So, again, going in and actually repairing the esophagus, the actual rupture in there. Um, maybe going in and doing a surgical repair, maybe doing like a cutting a part of the esophagus and then restitching it together. Uh, what would be some indications for not doing an actual surgery? Mediastinal link is contained, so it's not super diffuse, it's not kind of a spreading a significantly. Patient is not septic or hemodynamically unstable, that's probably one of the big ones. Contrast from the leak can flow back into the esophagus. So if it does leak, it can flow back into the esophagus. Access to contrast studies and readily available CT surgeon. So again, if you have a facility that has an ease of access to these contrast studies that can be done quickly, and a cardiac or thoracic surgeon on standby in case the patient does decompensate. All the above, none of the above, one and three, two and four. I was just messing with you guys, to be honest with you. You guys probably already know. It's, it's all the above, right? We're going with all of them. So all the above, I think, is the best thing to think about here. If the mediastinal leak isn't like super diffuse and spreading, it can actually flow back into the esophagus, um, and the person is not showing any signs of sepsis, hemodynamic instability, um, and you have a readily available uh, access to all of these studies and a, and a good you know, cardiothoracic surgeon on standby, then I would go ahead and say that there is you know, just monitor, um, you know, evaluate other kinds of you know supportive management. Uh, uh, mechanisms that we're utilizing right now and hold off if, if need be. It might actually repair on its own. Okie dokie. So I guess the next question is we've already got some non-surgical interventions on this guy right now that we're doing. We've got the NG tube, we got an MPO, we have IV fluids, we have pain control, and we have nausea anti-medic uh, medications on. What would be some non-surgical interventions that we could evaluate in this guy? What would be something that we could do? We could actually put in a stent in that area, potentially, um, for this individual. We could do a little glue, like an actual fibrin glue over that esophageal hole. Or we can actually do an endoclip, or we can do all the above. I might be a little ahead, sorry. Some of you guys are still answering the one from previous. What are not indications for surgery? So let's see. I apologize. I might have jumped a little ahead. Can you explain three? Contrast of uh, from leak can flow back into. It's just it's whenever you're doing the study that study that you have the contrast so, um, esophagram is usually a dynamic study so you'll be able to see things moving down out of the esophagus into the actual mediastinal tissue and if it's a small leak sometimes it'll actually just leak right back into the esophagus and move down into the stomach. And that's all it means is it can actually has a, a, a by, uh, byway flow, right? 
so it can flow out of the esophageal rupture and then back into the esophageal rupture back down into the stomach. All righty. Okay. So all of the above. Good. Yeah, you can't go wrong with any of these. Usually if I pick all the above, it's probably one of the answers. <laughs> okay. All righty. So the outcome for our patient, they did great. They actually never required any kind of surgery. The esophageal leak actually repaired in its time. And he decided to stop going ham and uh, you know, doing his all-night benders. <laughs> so a pretty good outcome for this individual. So I, I hope that this case study helped. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. You guys are so smart and so engaging. Um, it was really fun. Um, probably one of the most interesting case studies I got to do with you guys. I really enjoyed it. It was really fun. Um, I hope it helped. I hope it made sense, guys. Um, I think just the, the big thing to, you know, think about is uh, keep on, you know, keep working on your differentials. Uh, keep working on your differentials. Keep thinking about, I think one of the biggest things to think about, especially going into medicine, is what are the things that could potentially kill a patient? What are the most scary things uh, to think about? Because if you rule those out, you know, you have time to kind of like evaluate and think about um, other things that, you know, are as less significant. I think one of the big things to think about is, again, what are... When a person presents with a particular chief complaint, what are the things that are really dangerous, the things that could potentially kill the patient that I really need to rule out? Have those in your head and systematically utilize every, just think about every test that you're going to order. Why am I ordering this test? What is it going to tell me? Is it going to help me? And try your best to always keep searching on evidence-based medicine. We should practice medicine based upon the literature and what the evidence tells us. If we do that, uh, you, you relatively can't go wrong, okay? I hope all of this helped, guys. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. If you guys have any other questions, any other concerns, throw me some and uh, we'll wait like a, you know, a couple minutes, like maybe a minute or two, and then we'll, we'll, we'll head out and hopefully uh, you know, talk another time next week. One of the things that we're really trying to work on really hard right now um, is kind of a heads up is we're really working as hard as we can um, day in and day out um, to develop question banks for you guys. So we're really hoping that that'll be something that we um, really, really get into pretty consistently. Um, I've been working with a team lately to help me become more um, efficient and, and, and better at being able to write questions. Um, so we have a bunch of people working really hard, um, and we just have some, some big things that we're going to be hopefully, uh, putting out there for you guys for question banks and flashcards, hopefully relatively soon. Um, we're going to be also kind of getting into the microbiology lectures and we're going to start mixing it up. You know, I don't want to, I, I try to go by a system, you know, within the videos and then work through that entire system pathology wise. Um, and I would do it, we were doing a lot of neuropathology videos. But um, a lot of you guys probably would want more kind of like, you know, individual like systems and more of the bigger topics. Also, another big thing that you guys were going to be doing is nursing videos. Kristen is going to be uh, coming in and uh, doing some nursing videos for us pretty soon. Um, and so I hope you guys, you know, stay tuned for those. It's going to be great. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really excited. Could you do a case study analyzing a 12 lead EKG as a part of it? I think that'd be a cool thing. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. The only problem with these dang ECGs, and again, that's something that maybe we have to uh, look into, um, is zooming in. <laughs> in a case study, it's it's a little bit harder to be able to really zoom in. That's why it'd be ideal to do it in a video. Um, because we can actually pause and zoom in, zoom out, look at particular things. In a case study in a live time, like a, you know, real time situation, it's a little bit tougher to do that. But I think a case study taking a patient who presented with a you know relatively you know obvious uh, chief complaint that would warrant an EKG and then running through that wouldn't be a bad thing to do. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Um. Sorry, let me just look. There was another question here. Uh, 
could I get a trial subscription or something for the website so we can see what the notes, et cetera, are like, so we know if it's worth the money. Uh, I, so again, I, I don't really kind of uh, handle that aspect of things. I think um, um, Elias, if you reach out to our uh, Ninja Nerd um, lectures, um, at, at gmail or engineerdescience at gmail.com. We'll have one of the other people on the team get back to you. Um, I don't really deal too much with the subscriptions and the, the, the monetary aspect of things. Um, one of the things I'd say is that the notes that people who are medical uh, editors and illustrators, they've been working crazy hard and they're just ex extremely talented um, at taking and really putting in the most important aspects of the notes, the most important aspects of the illustrations. It just beautifully beautifully presenting it in a way that I could never ever do um, so I, I really really think that these notes and illustrations I mean they're absolutely astonishing um, so I think uh, our team is looking into trying different options of subscriptions uh, for those notes and illustrations and again we're really trying to start getting more options out there for you like um, question banks and flashcards I just want you guys to have everything that you guys need to succeed and do well um, I'm just so thankful to have this platform to work, you know, work with you guys um, oh, the mnemonic for chest pain. Yep, uh, pet mac, pulmonary embolism, esophageal rupture, tension pneumothorax, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, and cardiac tamponade. Oh, Rebecca, thanks, buddy. Yeah, I, 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 I'm like I said, I'm, I'm not one to think about monetary things. Well, I love doing these videos, man. I, I could just do them all the time. It's so fun knowing that I have a platform to help people. That's a reward enough for me. I know that sounds cheesy, but it's true. Um, I just want all the medical editors and illustrators and the people that work so hard um, to make these amazing notes and illustrations, and the people that worked hard on the website to, uh, you know for you guys to see how awesome those notes and illustrations are if i was still in school i i'm being honest i'd, I'd probably purchase a subscription because they're they're so awesome i couldn't do what they're doing they're pretty great yeah well Paco, i think it's a good idea let's we can call it a day i'm th i'm thankful guys i'm really uh you know uh, just thankful for so many awesome people out there you guys are so cool um so i hope this made sense i hope that you guys enjoyed this lecture um, and this case study on Borhoff syndrome and all of the ways to uh, run through differentials and how to manage it and how to be able to know what's the best evidence-based approach to it. All right, engineers, we love you. We thank you. And as always, until next time.